Playwright Tony Kushner is here. He has been called the playwright of the 90s, earning critical acclaim for his Tony and Pulitzer Prize winning drama, Angels in America. The play about living with AIDS in the 1980s and 1990s changed the landscape of American theater. His new play, Homebody Kabul, is his most ambitious piece of writing since that work. Years in the making, the timely play revolves around Kabul, Afghanistan. In the wake of September 11th, the work takes on a newfound resonance, and I am pleased to have Tony Kushner back at this table, uh, certainly in anticipation of what many people are looking to as an important piece of work. Thank you. Great to be it's back. It's great to have you back. It really is. Now, tell me where you've been since I last talked to you at the height of Angels in America. Uh, sort of all over the place. I, uh, I've written uh, f adaptations of four different plays. I've written two opera libretti, uh, the book and lyrics for a musical, which right. will be opening in next uh, fall at the public. Um, I've been working on this play um, and writing a bunch of essays and teaching and lecturing and doing whatever I could think uh, of doing to avoid writing a full-length play, which I've now finally uh, done. <laughs> so this is sort of the next uh, full-length play after the second part of Angels. Okay. Tell me, tell me how it came into being. Um, I've always been interested in Afghanistan, politically, the history of Afghanistan uh, since the days of the Soviet invasion. Um, and uh, I have kept track of what was going on there all the way through the withdrawal of the Soviet army and the civil years of civil war and chaos, and the rise of the Taliban, basically through reading the papers and, and other uh, kinds of research. And uh, an actress friend of mine in London, Kika Markham, um, who I've known for years, uh, asked me to write her a one-woman monologue to do in, with a series of monologues in a theater that she belonged to in London. And I wrote, I decided I'd write about Afghanistan. I went to the library. I found an old guidebook called A Historical Guide to the City of Kabul, written by a woman named Nancy Hatch Dupree, who's still alive and lives in Peshawar on the border of Pakistan right. and Afghanistan. And the book sort of inspired um, a strange character. I wrote the monologue for Kika and uh, then felt that the monologue had, uh, was only a beginning of a, of a story that I wanted to tell. And I started working on it, I guess, in like, 1997. And then in uh, 1999, uh, I wrote the second and third acts of it. Uh, and it's um, now going up at New York Theatre Workshop. And you completed it all before September 11th. And yeah, I mean, we're doing rewrites, the kind of rewrites you do in, you know, previews, sort of cleaning up characters and trying to get the length down. It's rather long. Um, but nothing substantially has changed, and none of the political facts, uh, none of the historical facts have changed. Um, it was all written before, long before, like last January. So it's, it is what it is. What is it about Afghanistan? Um, I've always thought it was a place, I mean, for me it's been a place, I think, because I'm very interested in socialism, I'm very interested in, in the application and the misapplication of socialist theory, uh, and the Soviet Union has always been a place that I've uh, been fascinated with, the Russian people. Uh, I was very, very disturbed by the behavior, of the atrocious behavior of the uh, Soviet army in Afghanistan, and, uh, and, and it was, you know, very much in the middle of the Cold War, sort of the end of the Cold War, the last big battle of the Cold War, in a sense. It was uncomfortable for me to feel that Ronald Reagan was doing anything right, um, but I supported, in a sense, the, the, the uh, arming of the Mujahideen against the uh, Soviet Union, the abandonment of Afghanistan by the West after the uh, Soviets withdrew, and the sinking of the country into a kind of heavily militarized chaos. Uh, the destruction of, of virtually every city in Afghanistan in those years and the rise of the Taliban. Uh, the, I'm always also interested in theocracies uh, of all kinds because I find them threatening and fascinating. And I, uh, so every time I've looked at Afghanistan and thought about Afghanistan, I found the things that I uh, take for granted or things that I assume to be true about the world challenged in a useful way. And I've always thought this is a country. I mean, really, when you read the history of the place, it's, it's always been at the center of world history. It's always been a stage on which the world's historical figures have uh, crossed and acted out. And so it seemed to me a very dramatic place. And, uh, and I've been proven correct about yeah, that. Yeah. Now, before September 11th, and your friends would call you up and say, what's happening? And you'd say, I'm writing this play about Afghanistan. They would say, what? Yeah, and why? Afghanistan? And why? And uh, all the interviews that I gave about the play in the sort of early fall, 
preview period of getting interviewed about new plays. Uh, in, in July and August, well, every f interviewer's first question was, why on earth write a play about Afghanistan? Do you think anybody will care? And I would say, well, you know, there's the Buddhas in Bamiyan and the Christian aid workers. I mean, the Taliban are always making news. So, you know, it is something that isn't completely off the radar screen. And I think people should care about it because it's, it's is now and will continue to be um, uh, an incredibly important um, uh, player in world affairs. I mean, for one thing, uh, as a supplier of heroin to the rest of the world, which is, of course, of great interest in, uh, to the United States. And um, people sort of shrugged and thought, well, you know, good luck. Um, I had no idea. I mean, I, I could never have imagined that, that, that we would be at war in Afghanistan um, and I can't believe that the play is going to be opening after the Taliban have gone, which I guess is happening even as we're speaking. You wanted to write about this country, and uh, I, w I want to know what you wanted to say in this play, and I know that's a terrible question. Yeah. You know, and, and who are the characters you create to say it? Well, I mean, I've always sort of believed that when you're writing a play as opposed to writing an essay or a book, you sort of allow your, your unconscious to take sure, you where it right. wants to go. And I created this very peculiar character basically out of reading this rather magnificently written little guidebook, which was out of date when I read it in 1997. I think the first time I read it, uh, it was, had been published in 1965 in Kabul. So the city that it described had disappeared. And I found that very moving, the relationship between this sort of city created by this magnificent language and, and this fascinating history living in a book and this, this uh, decimated actual place. So uh, I th this character emerged, this woman called the homebody, you never actually learn her name. And she's an amalgam of different things the way I feel about Kika Markham, who's in, this actress that I wrote it for. Uh, if you want to see her, you can rent uh, two English uh, girls, the Truffaut yeah, film. Right. She's one of the English girls. Um, and, uh, uh, and my mother, uh, who died 10 years ago, and the play really took me by surprise as being a play very much about, um, I mean, it's a play about a, a dead mother in a lot of ways. Um, and, and uh, the imagery that came out of, out of reading about Afghanistan of mutilated bodies and, and death and loss and grief and all of these things had uh, a tremendous impact. So as much as it's about Afghanistan, I also think it's a play, it's a play about a British family. It, it, they're British because I wrote it for a British actress to start with and the other family members who appeared subsequent uh, to the homebody were, you know, her family members, so they're all British. And, and, uh, and uh, the relationship between this, this sort of uh, tormented uh, life of a British family um, and, and this country uh, uh, that Britain and the United States have a, have a tormented relationship to, and the way that people use other countries as metaphors for their own inner misery, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the way in which the divide between inner misery and outer misery is really permeable and, and, and can uh, affect uh, mm. and transform, um, um, as I think, you know, uh, people experience on a daily basis. It's why I think that, you know, writing about politics is really, in a sense, only to write about human psychology, because our inner life is always uh, speaking very directly and, and transacting um, uh, with great vitality with the outer world and with the world of politics and history. And, and there really isn't a clear divide. So that, I think, is in part what the play is about. Mm. You are going to now read. I ask you to do this, so and, and um, because a the writing is brilliant, and secondly because it'll introduce us a little to, without having to know the, you know what, no more. So if you'll do this for me, I'd appreciate it. Okay, it's supposed to be a British housewife, so you have to pretend that I'm a British housewife. <laughs> I won't do the accent because that would be really quite ghastly. Right. Um, uh, she has uh, been. She's telling the story of searching through the uh, city of London for hats for a party she's throwing for her husband. And um, uh, she's found a hat, a store run by uh, Afghan refugees. And now she's describing uh, what happens in the store. She says, and this is uh, what happened, and it's all there is to my little tale, really. The hats were in a barrel which could be seen through the window. Puppets hung from the ceiling, carved freestanding figurines, bowls, cups, canopic jars, fish, elephants, tigers, uris, jinns, bodhisattvas, demiurges, attributes, symbols, carven abstractions representing metaphysical principles critical to the governance of perfect cosmologies now lost to all or almost all human memory, flatware, basket 
nightwear, carpets, slippers, knitted goods, amber beads, big as your baby's fists, barbaric, brazen metalware, armor plates like pangolin scales strung on thick, ropey catgut cordage meant to be worn by rather large, rather ferocious men, one would imagine, or who knows, hideous masks with great tusks and lolling tongues and more eyes than are usual, mind's eyes, I suppose, and revolving wire racks filled with postcards depicting the severed heads of the Queen and Tony Blair. Well, not severed necessarily, but with no body appended. Glaswegian A to Z guides um, and newspapers in Arabic and Urdu and Pushtu video cassettes of rock balladeers from Benares. Well, why go on and on? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We've all been in these sorts of shops, no bigger than from here to there, haven't we? As if a many cameled caravan, having roamed across the entire post colonial, not yet developed world, crossing the borders of the rainforested kingdoms of Kwashiorka and rickets and untreated gum disease and high infant mortality rates, gathering with desperate indiscriminateness, is that a word, on the mud pitted unpaved trade route its bits and boodle, had finally beached its great heavy, no longer portable self in a narrow coal scuttle of a shop on here, here, caravanserai here in the developed and overdeveloped and over, overdeveloped, paved, wasted, now deliquescent, post-first world, post-modern city of London. All the camels having flopped and toppled and fallen here and died of exhaustion, of shock, of the heartache of refugees. The goods simply piled high upon their dromedary bones, just where they came to rest, and set up shop atop the carcasses, and so on. I select ten hats, thread my way through the musty heaps of swag and thrown away and offcast and godforsaken, sorry, sorry, through the merchandise to the counter where a man, an Afghan man, my age, I think, perhaps a bit older, stands smiling, eager to ring up my purchases and make an imprint of my credit card. And as I hand the card to him, I see that three fingers on his right hand have been hacked off following the line of a perfect clean diagonal from middle to ring to little finger, which the last of the three fingers in the diagonal cuts descent by um, hatchet blade was hewn off almost completely like this, you see? Then she um, goes on to imagine asking the man uh, what happened to his hand. Um, and this is what she imagines he says to her. I was with the Mujahideen and the Russians did this. I was with the Mujahideen and an enemy faction of Mujahideen did this. I was with the Russians. I was known to have assisted the Russians. I did informer's work for Babrak Karmal. My name is in the files if they haven't been destroyed. The names I gave are in the files. There are no more files. I stole bread for my starving family. I stole bread from a starving family. I profaned, betrayed. According to some stricture, I erred and they chopped off the finger of my hand. Look, look at my country. Look at my Kabul, my city what is left of my city. The streets are as bare as the mountains now. The buildings are as ragged as mountains and as bare and empty of life. There is no life here, only fear. We do not live in buildings now. We live in terror in the cellars, in the caves, in the mountains. Only God can save us now. Only order can save us now. Only God's law, harsh and strictly administered, can save us now. Only the Department for the Promotion of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice can save us now. Only terror can save us from ruin. Only never-ending war. Save us from terror and never-ending war. Save my wife, they are stoning my wife, they are chasing her with sticks. Save my wife, save my daughter from punishment by God. Save us from God, from war, from exile, from oil exploration, from no oil exploration, from the West, from the children with rifles carrying stones. Only children with rifles carrying stones can save us now. You will never understand. It is hard. It was hard work to get into the UK. I am happy here in the UK. I am terrified I will be made to leave the UK. I cannot wait to leave the UK. I despise the UK. I voted for John major. I voted for Tony Blair. I did not. I cannot vote. I do not believe in voting. The people who ruined my hand were right to do so. They were wrong to do so. My hand is most certainly ruined. You will never understand. Why are you buying so many hats? It's brilliant, Tony. It really yeah. is. Uh, you, you must write for the ear, don't you? Yeah, I mean, I, I try to. I think that's a big part of what being a playwright is yeah, about. Yeah, dramatist it's, has to do that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it gives it a kind of, Breck described it as electricity. He said yeah. that you take, you take ordinary utterance and you sort of run an electrical current through it so that it keeps the ears open, which is a hard thing to do. And, and she has to go back to the initial guard. She has to go back to Afghanistan. Well, she's never been. She, she's go -go so, for all sorts of reasons, personal reasons again, and just out of pure uh, desire, she, it turns out, uh, leaves uh, London um, without really telling her fa family much yeah. and goes to Afghanistan. It's August 1998, and she arrives a uh, day before Clinton um, fires missiles into the uh, suspected terrorist training camps at Khost. 
and uh, and then sort of terrible things happen. Yeah. Now, what's the re relationship with her daughter? Uh, a tormented one. She has a, <laughs> she has a, a very unhappy uh, uh, twenty three year old daughter who's had a, a kind of a tumble um, that's really knocked her off of her track. She's uh, had some real sort of mental problems. She's come back home and she's living at home. And that is, in fact, one of the reasons why the woman flees uh, her life in London um, because of, uh, well, I won't go into the whole complicated thing, but the daughter and, and, and her husband uh, arrive in Afghanistan looking for um, the woman's body after it turns out that she's been attacked by a mob in the uh, demonstrations following the bombings in Khost. They believe she's American and, uh, and she's murdered. And they, these two people come to Afghanistan to find her body. And that's sort of the second and third acts of this yeah. play. We will tell them no more. Okay. Uh, several things have happened to you. Are you, have you been, since Angels got Pulitzer and everything else, such extraordinary success in London, in the United States, are you conscious of how high that bar is or not? Yeah, I mean, I think it's been a real uh, struggle to just, I mean, I didn't realize I was doing it at the time, but I think all the essays and all of the sort of um, other work that I've been doing has been an avoidance. When I started writing uh, the second and third acts of, of Homebody, I, I began to realize that it had been uh, 1993, I think, was when I wrote, um, 92, 93 was when I really uh, finished Perestroika. Uh, the second half of Angels, right. and uh, and when I was back doing this, it felt strange, and I realized it had just been a tremendously long time since I had written uh, a straight-out, serious drama, which is the thing that I think I ought to do. I mean, it's the thing that uh, I, I feel that I do better than the other things that I try to do. So I... I um, I guess I've been avoiding it, and I think that has a lot to do with, with being afraid of the next play. Um, and I thought, you know, I, I hope that, that this sort of opens. I mean, I'm opening it at New York Theatre Workshop, which is a theatre that I've always worked at and that I love. But it felt like a kind of a, a way to slip back into town quietly. And I was writing about a subject that I really didn't think would immediately uh, attract people's attention at the time. That's not why I chose it, but it felt to me like, okay, well, at least it's not another play about gay men living in New York, which would immediately invite comparison. This play is not at all like Angels, except that it's also very long. Uh, how, how long? Uh, I don't want to say. Right. I mean, it's, it's long. It's two intermissions, and we're trying to make it a little bit shorter. I think it's, it's now had two previews, and I think it's holding uh, the audience. They really seem to be with it up to the very end. So. Mm. Congratulations. Well, thanks. I should also say Angels in America is going to be an HBO multi-part series uh, help me on this. M Mike Nichols, Meryl Streep, Al Pacino. Uh, Meryl, St uh, Meryl Streep, Al Pacino, Emma Thompson, uh, Ben Shankman, Mary oh. Louise Parker, Patrick Wilson, uh, <laughs> Jeffrey Wright, and uh, Justin Kirk, uh, among other people I'm sure I'm forgetting, but those are sort of the, the principal ones now. And that's they may be up to it. Yeah, oh yeah, I think it's, a, it's an amazing <laughs> cast and a great director, so it's exciting. Uh, it's terrific to have you back in New York. Oh, it's terrific great. to have you with this play, and, and I can't wait to, to see it. December 19th, 19th is the opening night. Yeah. So. Good luck. Thanks. Thank you. Tony Kushner, uh, Homebody slash Cobble. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Playwright Tony Kushner is here. He has been called the playwright of the 90s, earning critical acclaim for his Tony and Pulitzer Prize winning drama, Angels in America. The play about living with AIDS in the 1980s and 1990s changed the landscape of American theater. His new play, Homebody Kabul, is his most ambitious piece of writing since that work. Years in the making, the timely play revolves around Kabul, Afghanistan. In the wake of September 11th, the work takes on a newfound book and lyrics for a musical, which will be opening in next uh, fall at the public. Um, I've been working on this play um, and writing a bunch of essays and teaching and lecturing and doing whatever I could think uh, of doing to avoid writing a full-length play, which I've now finally uh, done. <laughs> so this is sort of the next uh, full-length play after the second part of Angels. Okay. Tell me, tell me how it came into being. Um, I've always been interested in Afghanistan monologue to do in, with a series of monologues in a theater that she belonged to in London. And I wrote, I decided I'd write about Afghanistan. I went to the library, I found an old guidebook called The Historical Guide to the City of Kabul, written by a woman named Nancy Hatch Dupree, who's still alive and lives in Peshawar on the border of Pakistan right. and Afghanistan. 
And the book sort of inspired um, a strange character. I wrote the monologue for Kika and uh, then felt that the monologue had uh, was a resonance. And I am pleased to have Tony Kushner back at this table, uh, certainly in anticipation of what many people looking to as an important piece of work. Thank you. Great to be it's back. It's great to have you back. It really is. Now tell me where you've been since I last talked to you at the height of Angels in America. Uh, sort of all over the place. I, uh, I've written uh, f adaptations of four different plays. I've written two opera libretti, uh, the, particularly the history of Afghanistan uh, since the days of the Soviet invasion. Um, and uh, I have kept track of what was going on there all the way through the withdrawal of the Soviet army and the civil years of civil war and chaos, the rise of the Taliban, basically through reading the papers and, and other uh, kinds of research. And uh, an actress friend of mine in London, Kika Markham, um, who I've known for years, uh, asked me to write her a one-woman